Welcome back, lecture two, part three. Now let's continue with the doctrine of the Bible and look at number four, inspiration. What exactly is inspiration? Second Timothy chapter three. Look at me, verse 16 and 17. Second Timothy chapter three, verse 16 and 17. It says, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for what? For teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that what? So that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Let's look at the explanation. It's very simple. Inspiration. What is the doctrine of inspiration? It, this refers to the supernatural guidance of the writers of the scripture by the Spirit of God so that they would, so as they wrote was what, so as to what they wrote was the divine word of God. Right? Now, what does that mean? It was transcribed accurately, reliably, and without error. It was transcribed accurately, reliably, and without error in the original manuscripts, manuscripts, what we call the autographs. The original manuscripts in the original language, that, okay, was transcribed accurately, reliably, and without error. So the word inspiration itself pictures God breathing out his word to men. In the Greek, uh, theological terms is called theopanostos. And this means God breathed out his word. That's what it's talking about. He breathed, he is the author of his word. He breathed it out. Okay. He spoke it out. It was transcribed accurately, reliably, without error. That is what, and then we're talking about the original manuscripts. We're not talking about the interpretations. We're not talking about the. We're not talking about the the um, the translations. We're not talking about the versions of the Bible. We're talking about the original language, the Word of God that was written in. All right. So I need you to comprehend that concept with me. So what is the illustration? Now we have an extensive illustration here. I want to go through with you. Okay. Because I think you need to see this in, in, in many a light, if I can put it in those terms for you. Okay? Not everything written by an apostle or prophet was necessarily inspired. Paul wrote at least three epistles to the Corinthians, but apparently only two were inspired record. How do we know this? We know it because 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, we know those two books, right? However, there was one before that and in between. Look what he says, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 9 says, I wrote you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. Now, he's making reference here to something that he wrote, but it was not canonized, it was not inserted into the Bible as we know today. So not everything they wrote was necessarily inspired by God the Holy Spirit for it to be included in the canonicity in the Word of God. We take Samuel in the Old Testament. Samuel, Nathan, Gad. They each wrote accounts of David's life and only one of these prophets produced an inspired record. But we know they have other writings. We know it because, we know it not only because of the early church fathers, but we know it because the early church history, historians right, of the church. Eusebius, Josephus, Philo, these great historians okay, of their era okay, record that these books, and we also know from the libraries of, of old, now, much of these writings okay, were referred to, but were never included in the Bible. Only that which the Holy Spirit felt that needed to be canonized was actually put into the Bible. So we know, we have Samuel, Nathan, and Gad. Go to 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 29. 1 Chronicles 29, 29, an example says this. Now the acts of King David, from the first to the last, are written, notice what it says, in the Chronicles of Samuel the Seer. How many have ever read, read the Chronicles of Samuel the Seer? 
I don't think anybody here has. In the Chronicles of Nathan the Prophet, how many have written, the, uh, have read the, the Chronicles of Nathan the Prophet? I don't think anybody here. And in the Chronicles of Gad the Seer, I don't think anybody else has read any of Gad's work either. So remember what we're talking about, inspiration. Not everything written, okay? Not everything that was written by an apostle prophet was necessarily inspired. Well, in reference to 1 Chronicles 29, 29, you will note that these are, these are what we call non-canonical source material. Non-canonical source materials, which the author of Chronicles was, under divine inspiration, led to consult. Now, obviously, the author of 1 Chronicles consulted these books, these writings, but they were not included in the Bible. That's not a contradiction. You need to understand the discernible difference. That's what you need to understand. Okay? Many other such Hebrew writings are also mentioned by the Old Testament authors. You know, the Bible doesn't skirt the issue. The Bible doesn't run from it. You know, people talk about, well, you know, about all these other books, you know, that was never included, so I know I can't trust the Bible. So, No, in fact, the Bible is the one who illuminates the issue to us. The Bible is the one who reveals it to us that these other writings do exist, but they were not considered to be divine, divinely inspired. So, there's a bunch of them. Let me show you them. Just open your Bibles. Let's just walk through this okay, so you can understand this because I want you to comprehend inspiration. Then later on when we talk about the lost books in the Bible, okay, the lost books, we'll talk about that again. But for right now, our focus is in, on inspiration. What is inspiration, okay? In other words, it was accurate, reliable, and without error. These other sources that are mentioned in the Bible, okay, by these authors is just making a point of reference. It's not saying that those other writings were accurate, reliable, and without error. It's making a point of reference to support what they're saying. We see, in second, we see this in Joshua chapter 10, verse 13. It says, So the sun stood still and the moon stopped until the nation avenged themselves of their enemies. And it says, Is it not written in the book of Jasher? Who here has read the book of Jasher? And the sun stopped in the middle of the sky and did not hasten to go down for about a whole day. So Joshua, the book of Joshua is just verifying what the Bible says. 2 Samuel chapter 1 verse 18. 2 Samuel chapter 1 verse 18 says this, And he told them to teach the sons of Judah what? The song of the bow, behold, it is written where? In the book of Joshua. In the book of Joshua. <coughs> so we don't, we don't have that book. We've never read it. First Kings chapter 11, verse 41. First Kings chapter 11, verse 41 says this. It says, Now the rest of the acts of Solomon, and whatever he did, this is Bible, and his wisdom, are they not written in the book of the acts of Solomon? Who's read the book of the acts of Solomon? None, nobody that I know of. So there's obviously another writing out there that's just verifying what the Bible says. Well, let's go on. First Kings chapter 14 verse 29 says this. Just to give you these examples so that you comprehend that the Bible does not skirt the issue. The Bible doesn't run away from this issue. In First Kings chapter 14 verse 29 says this. He says, now the rest of the acts of Rehoboam, Reho, um, Reho, uh, okay, look at it says, and all that he did, Notice, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah? In the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah. Who's read that book? Second Chronicles chapter 9 verse 29 says this. Now the rest of the Acts of Solomon, from the first to the last, are they not written, look what he says, in the records of Nathan the prophet. Who's read the records of Nathan the prophet? And in the prophecy of, uh, uh, of Ahijah and the Shilonite, Ahijah the Shilonite. So, so we have, we have uh, Ahijah the Shilonite wrote a prophecy. And in the visions of Edo the seer, the visions of Edo the seer concerning Jerob Jeroboam and the son of Nebat. So the Bible doesn't run from the issue. The Bible reveals the issue, clearly communicates the issue to us. Second Chronicles chapter 12, verse 15 is another example of this. 
it says this. Now the acts of Rehoboam from first to last, are they not written where? In the records of Shemaiah the prophet. Who's read, who's read the, the book of the Shemaiah the prophet? And Edo the seer, according to, to what? To the genealogical enrollment. And, are, and, and there were the wars between Rehoboam and Jeroboam continually. It's not recorded anywhere that we know of, right? No way that we know about it. Hmm? Well, Second Chronicles thirteen twenty two. Second Chronicles thirteen twenty two tells us this. It says, now the rest of the acts of it says, it says the rest of the acts of Abi, uh, Abijah and his ways and his words are written where in the treatise of the prophets of Edo. In the treatise in the prophet of Edo. Who's read the treatise of the prophet of Edo? Second Chronicles twenty four twenty seven. Second Chronicles twenty four twenty seven says this, and to his sons into the many oracles. Look at this, and the many oracles against him and the rebuilding of the house of God. Behold, they are written where, in the treatise of the book of the kings. In the book of the kings, then Amaziah his son became king in his place. Second Chronicles twenty six twenty two says this, and the rest of the acts of, Uz of Uzziah, the first and the last, the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, has written. So there was another document that was written by him, but it's not included in the Bible. Second Chronicles 33, 19 says this, his prayer also had, it says, his prayer also and how God was entreated by him in all his sin, his unfaithfulness and the sites on which he built high places and erected the asherim and the carved images before he humbled himself. Behold, notice, they are written where? They are written in the records of Hosea. H-O-Z-A-I. Hosea. Well, who's written that book? So I want you to comprehend, okay? And doubtless others existed and were circulated as well. However, no claim can be made for the inspiration of all of these now lost books, quote unquote, inspiration being the Holy Spirit particular work in recording God's revealed truth solely as contained in what we would call the canonical scriptures. In other words, what's in this book. Okay. So what is the application? Since the scriptures are given to help Christians grow in maturity, they should rely upon them for what? For doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness, in other words, in right living. That's the reason why we had read earlier in 2 Timothy in chapter 3, if you recall, in verse 16 and 17, it says, all scripture is what? Theophanosto, it is God breathed by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. So that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every what? Good work. Amen? Let's talk about Holy Spirit inspiration. Now let's talk about the doctrine of the Holy Spirit inspiration. Completely different. Now go to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. Go to the New Testament, 2 Peter chapter 1. But this time, let's begin in verse 19. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19. Let's go there together, please. And let's go down to verse 21. So we have the doctrine, number five, Holy Spirit inspiration. Second Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 19 to verse 21. And note what the words actually say. So we have the prophetic word made more sure, to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp, shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. But know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. So what is the explanation of this particular doctrine? Short, remember this is just a panoramic view, this is a survey of the doctrines. The Scriptures were written by holy men of God, about 40 in all, 
as they were moved by the Holy Spirit to do so, while in no way denying the personalities of the human writers or rejecting the distinctiveness of their particular styles, the Holy Spirit controlled the process of bringing things to the writer's memories. That's what John chapter 16 talks to us about. And ensuring what they recorded was the fact, the very word of God. In John chapter 16, look at this. Let's read verses 12 to 15. I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But when he, what, who, the spirit, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for, for he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will disclose to you as to what is to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of mine, and I will disclose it to you. And all things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he takes of mine, and he will disclose it to you. So this is a sovereign act of God. This is why it's called Holy Spirit inspiration. Okay. So now, what is, the, what is the illustration? Well, Jeremiah. Jeremiah once was so frustrated that he wanted out, he wanted to quit, but God's Spirit compelled him to go on. You remember that in Jeremiah chapter 20? Go to chapter 20. Let's, let's read chapter 20, the book of Jeremiah, verse 7, 8, and 9. Look what he says. He says, O Lord, you have deceived me, and I was deceived. Here's Jeremiah having this conversation. You have overcome me and prevailed. I have become a laughingstock all day long. Everyone mocks me. Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, he's crying, he's complaining, he's lamenting. He's having a serious conversation with God here. For each time I speak, I cry aloud. I proclaim violence and destruction, because for me the word of the Lord has resulted in reproach and derision all day long. But if I say, I will remember him or speak any more in his name, I will not remember him or speak any more in his name, then in my heart it becomes like a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I am weary of it, holding it in, and I cannot endure it. You see that? Holy Spirit inspiration. You can't hold it back. Likewise, Jonah. Remember Jonah? We know the story of Jonah, right? At first refused to take God's message to Nineveh, but later obeyed God's second call. Remember that? Because God had to spank him. Look at Jonah chapter 3. In Jonah, we see this in verses 1, 2, 3, and 4. In Jonah chapter 3, verses 1, 2, and 3, and 4, says this. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. Now he was a knucklehead. No, no, let's not be so critical because, you know, not all of us are paid to, uh, necessarily obedient the first time either. So he says in verse 2, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and proclaim to, its proclam to it the proclamation which I am going to tell you. It's not your words, it's my words. And he says, So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city at three days' walk. Then Jonah began to go through the city's one-day walk, and he cried out, and yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. He brings forth the word of God in this situation. So what is the application? As Christians read the Bible, they can be confident that it is the very word of God. I have no doubt this is the word of God. I don't have to, you don't have to convince me of that. You don't have to convince me of that at all. The sixth doctrine. All scriptures, I want to talk about the authority of the scriptures. Authority of the scriptures. Turn your Bibles to the book of John chapter 10. John chapter 10. Let's read from verse 31 to 38. 31 to 38, John chapter 10. And we're going to talk about now is the do sixth doctrine, okay, which is the sixth sub doctrine is going to be what? It's going to be the authority of the scriptures. That's probably the challenge that we face today. In John chapter 10, it says this, verse 31, all the way to 38. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered, I show you many good works from the Father, for which of them are you stoning me? And the Jews answered him, For good work we do not stone you, but for the blasphemy, and because you being a man, make yourself out to be God. And Jesus answered him and said, Has it not been written in your law, I said you are God's? That's his, he's quoting the book of Psalms. If he called them God, to so whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent to the world, you are blaspheming me because I said I am the Son of God? But if I do not do the works of my Father and do not believe, okay, but of, 
But if I do them, though they may not believe, believe the works so that you may know and understand the Father is in me and I in the Father. So notice this profound scripture here. Okay. So what is authority of scripture? Well, here's the explanation. The scriptures, both Old and New Testaments, were recognized by the early church as what? As the final authority on all matters of faith and practice. See, it's, it doesn't matter what the modern church thinks. It's what was established. Okay? Jesus spoke of the letters. Remember that? You remember that in the, in the book of Matthew? In Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, 18, and 19? You remember that? This is what Jesus said. He said, do not think that I came to abolish the law of the prophets. I did not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. He says, I didn't come to abolish the law. I didn't come here to undo the authority of Scripture. That's not what I came to do here. For I truly say unto you, unless until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or the stroke shall pass from the law until it is all accomplished. Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Look at the verb tenses. In Matthew chapter 22. Look what he says in verse 31 and 32. Matthew chapter 22. Okay. Now let's read from verse 29. Look what he says. But Jesus answered and said to them, You are mistaken, not understanding the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor given or nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. But regarding the resurrection of the dead, you have not read what was spoken to you by God. You have not consulted the authority of the scriptures. I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And when the crowds heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. Completely astonished. So you see, you need to understand some part of Paul's argument, part of Paul's argument against the legalism in Galatia, remember that? Was based upon a simple noun that the apostles held as, as authoritative. Because you remember in Galatians chapter 3, okay, we see this. Okay? Okay? He says this, brethren, in verse 15, 16, and 17, he says, Brethren, I speak in terms of human relations, even though it is only a man's covenant, yet it has been ratified. No one sits it aside. No one sit, sits it aside or adds conditions to it. Welcome back. This is Lecture 2, Part 4, and we're going to continue. Now, I want to pick up where we left off, talking about the authority of Scripture. The authority of Scripture. If you recall in our last session, I left you with the book of Galatians. Now, part of Paul's argument against legalism in Galatia, because that is what took place in Galatia, at least in those churches in area, was based upon a simple noun that the apostle, that the apostle held as authoritative. Now, let me show you this. In Galatians chapter 3, we're going to start to read here verse 15. Let's work down to verse 17. Brethren, I speak in terms of human relations. Even though it is only a man's covenant, yet when it has been ratified, no one sets it aside or adds conditions to it. Now, look at verse 16. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say, and to seeds, as in plural, as referring to many, but rather to one, and to your seed, that is Christ. What I am saying is this, the law which came, for, came 430 years later does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God so as to nullify the promise. So what Paul says is very clear that they were to rely strictly on what the Word of God said, not what was added 430 years later. 
Jesus said that the scripture cannot be broken, that is treated as though it does not exist. Remember, we read that earlier in the book of John. And in the book of John, he said this in chapter 10, verse 35. He said, if he called them gods, to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be nullified, it cannot be broken. There is an authority of the word of God, and we must remember that truth. You simply cannot ignore it or nullify it or attempt to do so. So, now let's look at the illustration of this. A brief reading of the book of Matthew shows how authoritative the Old Testament was to the early Christians. That this authority applied also to the New Testament is illustrated by Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 18. Don't forget that all of the New Testament preachers, as they're recorded, and at least in the New Test- in the New Covenant here, in the New Testament, okay, what did they preach? They didn't have a New Testament. They preached the Old Testament. So a brief reading just of the birth book of Matthew alone okay, reveals to us, it shows to us how it shows to us how authoritative the Old Testament was to all of the early Christians. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, <coughs> he says in verse 17 and 18, the elders who rule well are to be considered worthy of double honor especially to those who work hard at preaching and teaching, especially to those who bring forth the authority of Scripture. For the Scripture says, you shall not muzzle the ox while he was threshing, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. Now, what is Paul doing? Well, what Paul is doing, he's quoting the Old Testament. Now, you remember back in Deuteronomy 25, 4, he said this, You shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing. This is what Paul is quoting. In other words, what he, his quote is authenticating the authority of the scriptures of the Old Testament. That's exactly what you and I are called to do. Either we submit to the authority of the Word of God, or we don't submit to the authority of the Word of God. You must either reject the Word of God or accept the Word of God, but you cannot change the Word of God. You don't have that authority. I don't have that authority. We do not have that authority. So Paul is is verifying and authenticating the veracity of the authority of Scripture. In the book of Luke, for example, we see this also in verse 7. Remember when Jesus sent out the 70? Remember that? And there's a whole story there in the book, Luke chapter 10. But look at verse 7. He says, Stay in that house, eating and drinking what they give you, for the laborer is worthy of his wages. What is Jesus doing? The same thing that Paul was doing. He's quoting scripture from the Old Testament. The laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not keep moving from house to house. Why? Because Jesus was relying on the absolute authority of Scripture as he instructed the 70 to go out and witness and share the gospel. So what is the application? Simple. As we study the Scriptures, we must be careful to be what? Not just hearers, but to be doers of the Word and not hearers only. Amen? Now let's talk about that great subject, inerrancy. Doctrine on, on the doctrine of inerrancy. This is number seven, the doctrine of inerrancy. Go to with me to, to John chapter 17. This is the great prayer of Jesus Christ. This is the Lord's Prayer. This is the Lord's Prayer as opposed to Matthew chapter 6 and Luke and Mark, which talks about it's really the model prayer or the disciples' prayer. But John 17 is the Lord's Prayer. So turn your Bible, let's go to John 17. We're going to talk about inerrancy. What is that Bible doctrine, inerrancy? Well, in John 17, we start in verse 13, and let's work our way down to verse 19. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, so that they may have my joy made full in themselves. I have given them what? Your word. And the world has hated them, 
because they are not of this world, even as I am not of the world. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Now look at verse 17. This is really crucial. He says, sanctify, make them holy in the truth. And he says, what truth? He says, your word, your word is truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they may themselves also may be sanctified in the truth. So when we look at this Bible doctrine of inerrancy, here's the explanation, brief, very brief. When applied to Scripture, the term inerrancy means what? It means what God revealed and inspired is accurate, reliable, authoritative, and without error. Let me repeat, inerrancy. When applied to Scripture, the term inerrancy means what the God, what God revealed and inspired is accurate, reliable, authoritative, and without error. I'm talking about the original manuscripts, the original writings that were written down. I'm not talking about the versions and the copies that were made thereafter. Okay? That's not what I'm talking to you about. Okay? Since all Scripture is inspired... Every word of God is true. Just as a book often reflects the character of its writer, so the scripture is without error because God is without fault. That's the inerrancy. That's the doctrine. What's the illustration? Jesus apply, upheld the principle of inerrancy okay, when he preached in Nazareth and he carefully stopped reading in the middle of a verse before announcing the fulfillment of that scripture that day. Remember that? Look at Isaiah chapter 6. Go with me in the book of Isaiah. Now, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 61, I'm sorry, did I say 6? 61. And Isaiah chapter 61 says this. Now, I want you to see this with me and look at verse 1 and 2. It says, The Spirit of the Lord of God is upon me because the Lord God has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the favorable, the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. Now, we know that Luke quotes this, right? Go to the book of Luke now. In the book of Luke, we see this in chapter 4, verse 16. Let's work our passage down from verse 16 to 21. Luke 4 verses 16 and 21, and let me show you this. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and was his custom. He entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and he opened the book and found the place where it was written, and this is what it says. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me and to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim the release to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, and set free those who are oppressed to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he closed the books, gave it back to the attendant, sat down in his eyes of all, the, and the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. This is exactly what took place here. You see, the rest of the book of Isaiah passage will be fulfilled. And you have to understand that we had a partial fulfillment on that day. But there's more of this prophecy that's going to get fulfilled in the second coming. Right? So what is the application? As we read the scriptures, we can have total confidence in their, in their reliability and accuracy. I don't have any doubts about that. That's what the doctrine of inerrancy is about. It's not about the translations and the versions that was created later on. That's not what they're talking about. It's talking about its original content. That's inerrancy. Let's talk about the doctrine of preservation of Scripture. Preservation of Scriptures. Go to the Old Testament, Jeremiah chapter 36. Jeremiah chapter 36 with me. We're talking about the preservation of Scripture because this is also part of the argument. This is, you know, the Scriptures were lost, so, you know, and things were made up, and so forth, and so forth, and so forth, and, and uh, there was bad copying, bad errors when they were copied, and so forth, and so forth. Let me talk about the preservation of Scriptures. Because okay? I don't have any doubt about it. First of all, let me tell you about 
the key in understanding this uh, particular doctrine. In 1948, the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in the Qumran caves of Israel. Little shepherd boy was going along, some of his, his flock had separated, he began to look for them in the mountain ranges, right? There are caves high up. I've been to this place in Israel, when I was in Israel, and a boy apparently took a rock, threw it up there to see if one of his flock had gotten in there. When he threw it, he hit something and heard something break. Okay? The boy climbs up, goes into this cave, and discovers that in these large pots, if you will, these large pots, are all of these scrolls that have been stored there in the cool of the cave, okay? Perfect conditions for preservation. It's not until 1948 when these scrolls were discovered. Then there was a lot of legal jockeying for the ownership of these scrolls. And this took years. This takes us out of 1948 into the 1950s, into the 1960s. This is only 2014 at the moment when I happen to be teaching this class at the moment. Right? So now, this takes us into, this takes us into the 1960s. It took quite a while before the full study of all of these scrolls was made and then made available to various institutions throughout the United States and throughout the world so that people can accurately study them. They have to be preserved, taken care of, because once it left that, once it leaves that cool cave under perfect conditions, okay, temperature affects it. It's preserved, studied. It's not until you get into the 70s, the decade of the 70s now, where a wider distribution is now made available for institutions, seminaries, Bible universities, can get their hands on professors, theologians, academicians, that they discover the accuracy of the scriptures it is solidified at this point in the history of the church, finally, into the 1970s, rolling into the 80s. This is only the year 2014, at least for the day of the class for, that I'm teaching this right now. Now, what is the preservation of scriptures? If you look at this, go to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 36. <clears throat> Look at verse 27 and 28. God always found a way of preserving his word. Didn't matter what evil beset upon Israel, upon the church, upon the prophets. God always found a way of preserving it. An example of that would be Jeremiah 36, verse 27, 28. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah after the king had burned the scroll and the words which Baruch had written at the dictation of Jeremiah, saying, Take again another scroll and write it on all and write on all the former words that were on the first scroll which Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, had burned. So here comes God. God, in a sovereign act, in a sovereign external act to man, instructs Jeremiah, pick up another scroll. He says, I will tell you everything that was on that original scroll. Write it down. This is God. This is the omniscient God who knows everything, the omnipotent God, the all-powerful God the omnipresent God. Nothing is out of his sight because he's present everywhere. Okay? The creator of absolutely everything. Okay? What we would call in theology, in, in, in theological term, ex nihilo. Out of nothing, 
absolutely nothing who created everything. Mm -hmm. Brings back to Jeremiah all of the words so he can write them down again. God is in charge of preserving his scriptures. Now, let me help you also. In, um, it's not until we get to the last five years, in the last five years, do we now have available about 5,000 scrolls, about 5,000 scrolls that have now been digitized. They're now available to us. They've now been digitized. I have those. I have a digitized form for it. You know, and, they're, and they're numbered. Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, Kumran 1, Q1, 2, Kumran 3, Kumran 4, or P1, P2, P4, P74, P75, Papyrus 1, Papyrus 2. Okay. And now they've been digitized. So now I have the original languages with me, okay? And I can now study from the original Hebrew, okay? I can study from the original languages, okay? As well as scrolls that are in Greek and compare them with our versions today. The accuracy is, at, is beyond description, considering that God used, now think about this carefully, he used scribes. He used all these men to make copies of copies of copies of copies, and the incredible accuracy that they did this. Why? Because this was under the direction of God. So the preservation of scriptures is an important doctrine for us to understand when we study the doctrine of the Bible. God, who inspired the scripture, has throughout the years protected his word from the attacks of the evil men so as to preserve its content and existence. Now, while the autographs, the original manuscripts, have long since disappeared, Ancient copies and quotations from early Christian leaders demonstrates the preservation, demonstrate the preservation of Scripture. If there were no manuscripts, a complete copy of the Scriptures could be reproduced simply from the many quotations found in the writings of the church fathers. What is the illustration? God's preservation of Scriptures was demonstrated in the ministry of Jeremiah. When the king destroyed the first scroll of his prophecy, God had to reproduce to ensure his preservation. That's what Jeremiah chapter 36, 27 tells us. He says, Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah after the king had burned the scroll, and the words which Baruch had written at the dictation of Jeremiah the same. And God gave it to him again. Because we know that because in verse 20 it says, Take again another scroll and write on it the former words which that were on the first scroll which Jehoiakim the king of Judah burned. God is more than capable of preserving his own scriptures. What is the application? <coughs> Excuse me. As we read the scriptures, the fact that God has preserved them for us over the years should emphasize the importance. Think about it. If God took the time to ensure, and he uses all of these mechanisms, for lack of another term, all of these distinct ways to preserve his scripture, it must be important. Now let's talk about the lost books. Now here is where we're going to get into, and I mentioned this to you earlier when we had spoken about, all right, <clears throat> um, about inspiration. You remember that? I we're talking about the lost books. Turn your Bible to Second Chronicles chapter thirty-three. What is the concept of the lost books? What is that? Well. There are at least a dozen books, listen to this explanation, there are at least a dozen books cited in Scripture that are not part of our Bible. The Scriptures quote them, they cite them, but they're not part of the Bible. So we, I want you to see this, 2 Chronicles 33, verse 19, says this. Now I'm going to start in verse 18, let's go to verse 20. We're going to talk about the doctrine of lost books. He says, now the rest of the acts of Manasseh, even his prayer to his God, and the words of the seers who spoke to him in the name of the Lord God of Israel, behold, they are among the records of the kings of Israel. His prayer also, and how God was entreated by him, and, and all his sin, his unfaithfulness, and the sites on which he built high places, and erected the ashram, and the carved images, before he humbled himself, behold, they are written in the records of Hosiah. 
So Manasseh slept with his fathers, and they were buried with him, and they buried him, him in his own house. And Am and his son became king in his place. So look what we have here. Okay. So we have a number of other literature outside of Scripture that the Scripture quotes only as a, as a point of verification of its own veracity. It's not that these lost books. Do not misunderstand me. It's not that these lost books have left the Bible empty or leaves us in a state of ignorance as, as it has been insinuated by a lot of academicians and a lot of professors, as the president of our seminary has said many a times in the past before. Some people have been educated beyond their intelligence, and I agree with that. Okay? So I want you to understand, okay, these lost books have absolutely no impact as to the veracity of the Bible. What it does, it verifies what it already has. 